unless you've gone through that, and unless you've gone through that kind of terror, you don't know what it's like to be a trans person. I don't think you really realise how gendered the world is until you step outside of that. I think Derry is a very positive place for the trans community and always has been. The outpouring of support that I got was just actually overwhelming. We all want to pay our mortgage. We want to maybe go away on a holiday once or twice a year. We're no different, but we just want equality for all. The responsibility for that change does not lie on their shoulders. It relies on the rest of us to pick them back up and to keep marching forward. Growing up, I always kind of, I felt a bit different and I couldn't really put my words to, to how I was feeling. Um, talking to my mommy, my mommy told me that I used to have a machine <laughs> that I would go under. So I would have this pretend machine that I would go under and I would come out a boy. Um, funnily enough, she never ever clocked that I might be transgender. She kind of got a shock when I did tell her. But I suppose I really started questioning my gender when two of my friends came out as transgender. Um, but it would have been uh, another six years after that before I actually came out and, and said the words. My name is Katrina Cunningham and I am a very proud grandmother of a young trans man here in Derry. And um, my uh, grandchild is called Luke. And as a family, we have been very supportive and are delighted that Luke is the person that he's meant to be now. I had this really amazing experience when I had realised within myself that I was non-binary, that I was genderqueer. Um, and I use the term genderqueer as opposed to non-binary because I don't like describing myself by what I'm not. And I fully would love to embrace a world where we could move beyond the binary and if people want to be binary, that's cool, but we can also have beyond the binary. <laughs> so um, so the word binary is a bit like it, it implies there's only two choices. But anyway, I realized this in myself and I hadn't told anyone else yet, but I just knew it with a certainty. And I went to uh, Lidl to do my grocery shopping and I just had this enormous sense of relief. My name is Bernie and I'm the mother of a trans son. I found out when a letter was sent to my house to my then daughter, which she asked me to open, not realising it was from the gender clinic. And that's how I found out. Luke came to me when he was 17. He had told the family six months before this that he was gay and that had been accepted, there was no problem. Then he came to me and told me that, that he felt that he was a man in a woman's body. And the first thing, I, did, I was absolutely shocked. But I knew by him straight away that he was quite adamant and he'd, you know, he'd thought about this and he thought about what he was going to say to me. I left um, Derry when I was about 17. Um, I knew I was gay at that age. I suppose when I was younger, I knew I was different, but I didn't know what the word gay was. But I suppose about 14, 15, I knew it. And then just before I was 18, I moved to Edinburgh. Um, and I have the same friends now that I had then, um, 35, 36 years later. There was a core group of us, but maybe five or six, and we all really got on well. And it transpired then that um, one of the group, um, revealed to us all that they were what he called trans. Somebody coming from Derry and not knowing a while lot, probably 35, 36 years ago, that was a real revelation. Well, I think I first to realise that I was different to other little boys, uh, quite young, really, I was about three, and I couldn't understand it. And, and I used to gravitate towards my sister and her friends. And like whenever you're that age and you play doctors and nurses, I was the one that always ended up pregnant. <laughs> um, but I think it was about, I was about seven and I realised that I was a girl. Don't ask me how I know, I know it intrinsically. And that word transgender, because I'm an old lady, um, had not even been invented in those days. And there was no way that I could 
tell anybody that was the way I felt. You know, I come from a mining family and I couldn't go to my daddy and say, well, dad, I'm really a girl. Because he just said, don't be stupid, you know, go get coal in. Uh, so for me, it was, it was all in all, 35 years of agony. So I'm lucky enough that three of my closest friends um, are trans. Um, I've had these friendships for 15 plus years. Um, some of them, two of them are from primary school. I always kind of knew. Um, we always knew that we were different, expressed our genders differently. Um, so for two of them, like it didn't really come as a surprise when they came out to me. I guess that I was just elated that we could, you know, that they were affirmed and, and their own identities and that they could live in that way. Um, my first fear was for him. I thought, what is going to happen to him? You're worried about the general public. You're worried about other people's opinions. You want to protect your grandchild, always. So the first thing you do, are you sure? Are you sure? Uh, then I contacted Rainbow, and Rainbow gave me the number of a woman in Belfast from Sale called Shirley. And I phoned Shirley and I said, Shirley, I haven't a clue. I don't want to say the wrong thing, but I want to be 100% behind my grandson. And she gave me information. Uh, one of the things that I did say was, maybe it's just a phase. And Shirley said, no, it's not a phase. And I needed to know that. That was where I started then on my journey to be the best granny I could be and the best support I could be because I didn't know what he was going to face in the outside world. I was terrified to tell my parents. Um, I just, I was scared that they were going to see me different or weren't going to love me the same way, uh, which I know now is absolutely ridiculous. Um, I suppose I was really scared about how the rest of the world would see me. I was scared that I would face criticism. I, I guess my biggest fear was around how the trans and non-binary community would react um, because it's a community that I've been a part of for many years on a, on a sort of peripheral level or as an ally or as a supporter. And um, so I was, as part of the sort of journey to self-realisation um, and, and about realising my identity, I really had to interrogate my motives around that because I wanted to make sure that this was something that was very real and very right for me um, and that that my motives were pure and true in that regard. Um, uh, I, I have overcome that fear, obviously, because I've just realised, well, do you know what? Like literally no one else on this earth has the right to tell me what my identity is. And uh, I fully claim the right to self-identify the person I found most awkward coming out to was one of my best friends who is a trans woman. And um, I was, and I don't know why, because she's completely lovely and she was gorgeous and she was totally accepting. And, uh, you know, when I talked through my feelings about how I'd got to this place, she said that they, a lot of those were really resonant feelings and experiences for her as well. And, um, and I guess too, because I personally find it like, I find it a weird thing, the idea that trans people and non-binary people are put in the same basket because I, I've grown up with a trans person. My daughter is trans and her experience is so different to mine. Um, and most of my friends who are trans, their experiences are so different to mine. Well, I was shocked. I was stunned. Absolutely stunned, and uh, I don't know that I feared anything in particular. I just uh, I had never come across it before. I had no idea what was going on, or what was happening, or what was likely to happen. But I suppose the one fear I had was that if he went through with this, he would lead a very, very difficult life. I was worried about what way it would affect his job. Um, his friendships, um, me and, and his wider family. I thought, you know, will anybody accept them? Will I ever accept it? Um, I just didn't know what was going to happen to him or what was going to happen next.
I found it concerning because I was worried what was it like because I knew what I went through as a gay man in Derry. And I knew at that stage in those early days there were such many people frowning on the trans community. Um, and it was a very difficult time. But I think the strength came that there was about six or seven of us and we were all very tight together. And it didn't really matter um, what was going on. We just cared for one another and we were at that bond was strong. I didn't really have many fears for those two because maybe because I seen them often and, and we all ran around in the same group and we were a very queer friend group anyway. And so um, we all just, we kept ourselves good. And we were, we were our own wee, our own wee bubble. Um, my other close friend, he lives in London. Um, and I guess that so, and he came out a bit later. And so it was a wee, wee bit different because I was applying uh, maybe an adult context to his coming out as opposed to a teenage context that I had with my other two friends. You know, his home situation was different and I guess that I felt not scared but a wee bit more worried about that because I couldn't be there for him in the same way that I could be there for my two friends that love locally. Um, but I had absolutely nothing to worry about. He's doing great. Um, all my friends are doing great and we're all still the closest of friends. So I'm very, very lucky to have them all. The first time I heard the word transgender was when I was 17. And that was because there was two very famous trans women, one called April Ashley, and they were called Caroline Cossey in the, in the Sunday Mirror, I think it was. Um, and what they were saying about their, their early lives, uh, about when they were young, was exactly how I felt. Uh, and that's when I first came across the word transgender. But at 17, there was nowhere I could go to. Because really in those days, the only treatment for, for gender dysphoria, is what trans people um, are affected by, was electric shock treatment and aversion therapy. That was it. And I was being tormented enough without having to go through that. So because everybody was saying that I was a guy, I sort of grinned and bared it and tried to get on with life. But I tried to um, to continue. I was cross-dressing and you know, quietly, um, trying to find out more information. Um, one person, I read the book, and I had to do it in the library quietly. And it was amazing that a library in South Yorkshire had the book by Jan Morrison, who was a trans woman, uh, Jan Morris, who very famously climbed Mount Everest. And I read her story, um, but I had to do it in secret. And lots of things like that had to be done in secret because I just, I was terrified of somebody finding out. If somebody found out, that would be the end of the world. And unless you've gone through that, unless you've gone through that kind of terror and fear, you don't know what it's like. You don't know what it's like to be a trans person. The transition period was very, very difficult. And again, I think was so challenging was um, they had to go and do it privately. Um, there wasn't support there from the National Health Service, whatever. And again, I suppose it was like, um, if you had money, you could maybe get support, counselling or whatever. The results was that people had to go and sacrifice and work up and save and go and get the treatment themselves because it just wasn't available in the National Health at that stage. Medically wise, there's no support out there for well, there's very little support i mean you have the likes of rainbow project and mermaids but the gender identity clinic itself has waiting lists that are extremely long some people are waiting three or four years to even go and speak to someone initially um so i went private for all my treatment uh, that I've received so far? All the information that I got uh, at the start would have been from SEAL. Um, they were able to talk to me about how it is for families, um, and how it is for Luke. I was able to even talk to other young trans people just to know how they felt because we wanted to be in this journey, as you call it, with them all the time. So we got an awful lot of information. 
and I was able to pass that on to members of my family. They were able to give me like, you know, websites, different things. I mean, there was even a program on quite recent, I think it was called Mermaids. It was a drama on TV. And after watching that, my family, you know, they were saying, God, imagine, you know, so it's really educating people. It's I've learned, it's all about educating people and letting them know and talk to people that are involved because these young people especially need a safety net around them from their family and their friends. Retrospectively, looking back, I can kind of think, God, what impact would something like this would have had on him and for us, you know, in terms of being like queer young people at the time. Um, and as I say, maybe we wouldn't have come along. But even for advice, there's a lot of misinformation out there. There's a lot of, you know, a lot of people self-medicate when they're transitioning. And there's a lot of information and advice that we want to get out there in terms of that. Um, access to, to certain resources to other trans people your age you're maybe going through something similar um especially now we're dealing with the massive waiting lists and and you know that you know it's a really daunting time to become an artist trans regardless of your age but i think that if you can be linked in with any any service even if it's just us to you know to, just to have that kind of solid shoulder because yes you put your friends and your family but Maybe there's something that we can offer you too in the form of support, meeting other trans folks or advocating on your behalf as well. Um, but I, I can't help think about what we would have been like then had we have had what we have here now. I wouldn't have gotten through if it hadn't been to support an organisation called SEAL, which is to support families and friends, and in particular, one outreach worker. But eventually... I wanted to write a play as much from the family's point of view as anything else. And uh, because I thought that was something that wasn't talked about. It wasn't talked about. The effect this has, well, on my case, my mother in particular. But, um, yes, it, it, it followed his journey from a point of view. But, I mean, the play was primarily about... Um, a mother's experience and the journey that and in particular the mother's brother um and it, it was it was performed during pride week in Derry. it had three performances and it was um it went down very well and i wanted to, i wanted to uh to promote um the organization seal we left leaflets out in the audience and by midnight that night, they had so many hits on their um on their website they couldn't believe it. There's, there were that many people who wanted to who got in contact with them, and I felt that I had achieved what I wanted to achieve. Well, all all my fears were completely squashed like straight away because the outpouring of support that I got was just actually overwhelming. Um. Me and my wife have a YouTube channel. <laughs> so I I kinda had to publicly come out because we you know, people watch our channel and she couldn't just start calling me Jason and saying he and him, people be like, What what's going on? So I had to make a, a coming out video, uh, which I was very, very worried about. I was like expecting negative comments and expecting people to stop following us. And a few people did. Uh, but they were completely outnumbered by hundreds of comments of support from all our fans. Uh, my mum and my dad were so supportive and all my friends were really supportive. I didn't face, I was really, really lucky that I didn't face any kind of negative backlash at all from anyone in, in my immediate circle. I would say that my friends have been my greatest support through it and a lot of my followers on social media who've been incredibly supportive as well um I haven't really reached out to any groups to get help I think I'm I still feel like I'm such a newbie um that I kind of feel a bit uh, like I'm still finding my feet a bit in this area and um it has been really fascinating to realize that I, I no longer have 
all the groups that I had when I was when I thought I was a woman. So as a as a woman, you don't I don't think you really realize how gendered the world is and how much is geared towards specific genders until you step outside of that. And so that's been a really fascinating thing for me because there's there would have be times when there's spaces or um, issues that I would have been very comfortable with engaging with and, and spaces being in when I thought that I was a woman. Uh, and now I'm really conscious that those spaces aren't for me. And so, but there aren't many spaces for people who are genderqueer or people who are non-binary. That, that's weird because you're kind of existing in this sort of Netherland space where you know women's groups aren't right for me because I'm not a woman. Um, men's groups aren't right for me. I have no lived experience of life as a man uh, in any capacity at all, really. It is very different when you're when you're on that outer edge. It is um, a really I think I think it can be quite an isolating experience yeah I think it's really important to use your voice I think um, allies are so so important I think back to as a young gay man at 16 and watching people walking down my own town I think there was about 30 or 40 walked down from the top of the street to the bottom of the street and Shippey Street and Derry um, I think there may have been five or six people in that group who identified as gay as it was known then the rest were um, socialists, um, friends and family. They give me the strength then to know there was um, places like unions, um, socialists, other people, community workers who would support that. So I think now we have to now um, raise our voices for the trans community. When people raise the voices for what was then the gay men's um, society and the lesbians um, trying to get equality, we're all human, we all want equality. We all want to pay our mortgage. We want to maybe go away on a holiday once or twice a year. We're no different, but we just want equality for all. And I suppose that's why I like being part of Unison as well. Well, it's very, very important as a grandmother to be seen and to be heard. Uh, I know in my experience, even with doing, like I did, did a wee play uh, about uh, a young man, a young transgender man, and people were coming up to me in the street. I had women especially coming up to me in the street saying, I have a grandson or my nephew is not, you know, he's very confused about his gender, if he's non-binary or whatever. And for, for me to be able to, to put that out there, for somebody to be able to sit at home, see it and go, here's a phone number. I feel exactly the way that woman does, or I was in her position, or I think I'm in her position. It's very important. I wanted to say there's a play out there. I want to, I mean, a lot of, I know that one consultant psychiatrist and a number of psychiatric nurses came to the play. They actually came to the play. And the feedback I got from them was that they thought it was very useful because they knew that in time they were going to come across not just trans people, but their families. And they wanted to know, you know, I found at the time that it was an elephant in the room. You know, they talk about anything except that. And the play actually has a, has a bit of it about the elephant in the room. But I would like people also to try and say that this is not just something that happens to the individual. There's a whole family involved. And it's not easy for families. It's it's not easy. And families need as much support as and as much understanding, especially families that maybe don't seem to react particularly well to start with. And it's very easy to take them and condemn them and call them right wing, narrow minded old phobias. And I think you have to try and understand the journey that a family has to go through. Uh, I think I wrote the play as much for that as for anything else. I think everyone can agree that there's a lot of negative press surrounding trans people and non-binary people. And <clears throat> I think it's really important for people like me who have a voice to use that voice 
as the positive side to all those negative um those negative voices are always louder than ours for some reason so that's why i think it's important for us to to stand up and speak and try and be louder than them it's important for me to to appear in pride because in 1969 two black trans women started throwing not stones but shot glasses at policemen at the stonewall inn and i'm their legacy and if i'm their legacy then i have got to be on that parade i have got to be shouting and screaming for trans rights for lgbt rights uh rights for kids especially trans kids um because if we don't stand up and shout for them nobody's going to we're not talking points our lives and our rights are not up for debate uh, i do find it really odd this idea that there are people out there who believe that the moment that i wrote this i suddenly became a threat to other people uh, or that i suddenly in this moment that this was published i suddenly deserve less rights there is so much transphobia in our media um, in Ireland and in Northern Ireland and in, uh, you know, the, the United Kingdom, a lot, a lot of transphobia in the media. And so I think it's really important that we also hear from people who are not transphobic <laughs> and that we hear from people who are trans and we hear from people who are genderqueer or non-binary because we hear a lot about them. There's a lot about trans people. There's a lot of, about non-binary people, but not, not written by trans people or non-binary people. And I think that's really, really key. And I think it's really poor journalism to write articles about a demographic that you're not part of without engaging heavily in that community. And let me just say, there is a lot of poor journalism happening right now. So, so if I can just be a little drop in the ocean to counter that, well, I think that's a good thing. It's really key that people like me, and my partner, and my dad, and my aunties, and my uncles, and my cousins, and my friends, who aren't trans, and who aren't non-binary, or questioning their gender, it's really important that we use our voices and speak up. Um, that we use our brains and that we educate ourselves on what are these key issues that are impacting on trans folks because you know you might not have a personal connection with a trans person but that does not mean that these issues aren't there and that you can just bury your head in the sand and pretend it's not there these are people's lives and it's really important that we shout loud and that we fight hard to give our trans friends and family members the support that they need and that they deserve. Um, marriage equality was hard fought and it was hard won, but it was done through hearts and minds and everybody, not just same sex attracted people, but everybody, you know, linking arms and, and creating a movement and momentum. Um, and this is no different. I think that it's, again, it should be about hearts and minds, looking at individual stories and looking at a community and how they're being impacted by the failures that they're, that they're currently being handled. And it, the, the responsibility for that change does not lie on their shoulders because they're the victims in this. It relies on the rest of us to pick them back up and to keep marching forward. Well, this is Jemima. And Jemima was the first doll that I ever bought for myself. Um, and so she's very special. It's things like that, things that, that for a lot of people are quite normal. You know, if you grow up as, as a female, it's quite normal to have dolls. But I could never have my own dolls. I used to have to play with my sister's dolls when she weren't there. So Jemima is really, really special um, for me. Um, as you see, she's an Irish girl as well. <laughs> this photograph's very important to me means a lot. Um, I was sitting on the National Committee for Unison LGBT and our co-chair was a black trans man. So I asked um, Dave would he come to Derry and would he lead part of the Void Pride Parade and would he do some workshops. 
So Dave came over. Um, he stayed with me in my house, my home. Um, we had a great working relationship and good friendship. But it was just great to see um, a black trans man leading the parade in foil pride. So this picture brings a lot of progression, I think, for Derry. When I think of the first maybe um, six or seven people walked down Shippey Street um, and all our people standing on the sidelines, it's lovely to see this now and the group of people leading this and how Derry, um, how we've come on and how foil pride's grown in the last 30 years to make it a welcoming space for everybody. So this is my wee cow, um, as yet unnamed. Um, my friend that I've been talking about bought me this four and a half years ago whenever I got the job in Rainbow. It's always been a lifelong dream of mine to do this work um, and be lucky enough to have it as a job and as a career. Um, and I worked really hard to get it. But it was a random Tuesday and I had just started, it was my first week and the doorbell went and my friend was at the front door with a gift bag and I was like, oh my God, it's good to see you, come on. And he came in and he took time out of his day, left school to come and give me a congratulations card and a wee thing from my desk to congratulate me because he was really proud of me for getting this job because he knew how hard I worked. It just means so much to me because it really, like, I wouldn't know half the stuff if I hadn't have had a friend like him and, and my other two friends you know that have been so open and supportive of while they've been learning things about you know transitioning transitioning within Northern Ireland what barriers people go through you know he really shared a lot with me and that empowered me and educated me enough to be able to provide this support to other people and whenever I see it I just think about him and I just think you know it makes me proud of me for the achievements that I've done, but it also just makes me think, God, I'm so lucky to have a friend like that. So my object is actually a pair of shears. As I said, I had questioned for six years and I'd gone back and forth. I was like, I'm a trans, I'm a not trans. What, what is, what's happening? And one day I decided to cut my hair and I just decided to cut my hair. It was nothing. I wasn't cutting my hair to see if I liked it. I was cutting my hair because I was just sick of it and I shaved my hair all off down, down short similar to this and it was like an actual light bulb moment and I seen myself with short hair and I seen the beginnings of the man that I knew was on there and it was a real turning point for me and I think two days after I did that I came out and that's why I've brought my shears there today because they're very much a big part of my story. This is a book of poetry written by Luke. Luke is a brilliant poet. He's very creative and he puts a lot of his thoughts and his feelings, especially when he was going through darker times, into his poetry. Uh, now, because he has, he's, he's loving the way that he should have been loving and he is who he is, uh, it's a bit lighter, the poems, but he, um, he's, he's very talented and I'm so proud of him. And this is his book of poetry. So this is my article in the Irish Independent. Uh, magazine and the three pages three pages for me coming out <laughs> yeah so that's my piece um, mostly people were very supportive and um, uh, I, I knew that the majority of people would be supportive and I knew that there would be some people who would be hateful and transphobic and horrific and that's exactly what happened <laughs> To my precious second child, we never chose lipsticks together or went out dressed in style. We laughed each other's laughter and we smiled each other's smile. I never got to brush your hair or help you choose a wedding dress. But I've never loved you any more. I never loved you less. I never got to hear you say the special words I do, but I've heard you say I can and I will. And that's made me proud of you. You walked a lonely road alone and cried such bitter tears. You struggled so hard just to be yourself and suffered through the years. 
I never guessed your suffering. I got to ease your pain. But you never loved me any the less. You said so again and again. And so today I celebrate all that you have done. I miss you as my daughter, but I love you as my son. Look into the future on how this is all going to pan out. Like, I can't help but just think about the current situation now. The massive waiting lists and accessibility of basic healthcare, and the misinformation and the stigma that's out there, the misrepresentation in our media, and the witch hunt that's going on at the moment. It's really important that people understand that we're not some other, because being othered is the road to fascism. This idea that, you know, oh, well, I can't identify with that, I, I don't understand, I can't empathise with these people in this little community is, is, a, is a dark and scary road where people will then think, okay, well, I don't empathise with them, so maybe we should remove some of their rights. I think for, for my hope for the future is, is not so much for me, but my hopes are for the youngsters because I don't want them to go through the kind of crap that I went through. Uh, you know, 35 years being in agony, uh, not being allowed to be who I know I always was. It cannot possibly get any worse. It, it can't get worse before it gets better because we're in the worst part. We have to be. And it, it can't get worse before it gets better. It has to, it's going to crumble before it gets better. A lot of ways I'm very confident about the future for our trans community. Um, I, I'm a part of Unison. Um, I work hard with all the other people in the union and when I go to um, motions or go to conference I'm always very happy as time goes by that um, our trans motions or whatever are always really well supported and they're passed by everybody in the union. For a start where I live I think Derry is a very positive place for the trans community and always has been and uh, different groups together you know feminists, socialists, the gay community we you know we all work together um, and for our young people just to be happy, to be who they were meant to be themselves, to be able to go have surgery, not have surgery, live their lives the way they want, openly, be able to talk openly and to educate young people about sexuality, about gender and the difference and everything else. That's what I want and I think it's brilliant. There's so many families involved and so many friends. We're just humans having a human experience and maybe our human experience is a little bit different to yours but that's okay and that doesn't make us a threat. We need allies because we can't do it on our own. We need allies. We need people, decent people, to start to stand up and make their voices be counted. Uh, because at the end of the day, we're all human beings and we all deserve the right to live.